listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY Musician Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 44 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin, and this is a roundtable edition, so joining me are Chris and Robert. How are you guys doing today? Hello. Good morning. Good. Well, we have uh, lots of good stuff to talk about uh, from our last interview with Tom Jackson. Um, so we're going to skip the news this time, because there's you know not all that much interesting happened in the last couple weeks. The inauguration happened. Well, that's not music news, but <laughs> I think he hired some English bands to come play at it. Like that's true. You know, Sting. I didn't see very many American people playing it. You too. I guess they're Irish, but yeah, where were all the American bands? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's new international presidency. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's right. <laughs> Well, before we get into the discussion, uh, I just want to remind all our listeners that if you're enjoying the show and want to see it continue for years to come, I know I would, we'd really appreciate it if you left some positive feedback on the podcast page in iTunes. And uh, just, you know, this isn't for the benefit of our ego. There are people from distant lands who want to make sure that uh, the podcast and the time we put into it is worthwhile. So um, we definitely want to make sure you're out there and your vote matters and... uh, so don't be the silent majority on this one. Feel free to talk about how handsome the podcasters are, too, while you're at it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, enough about that. Let's move on to the real topic at hand. And uh, this turned out to be one of my favorite interviews, the interview with uh, Tom Jackson. I knew it'd be a good one, and it's someone that I've had in the back of my mind. we got to get him on the show for a long time. And uh, I, I was kind of interested in your guys's first reaction listening to it. I didn't know what you guys might think. Well, I think you thought I was going to be skeptical. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but I loved it. I was, I was, even from before I heard it, I was into it. I, why, why was Chris going to be skeptical? Because I'm always the curmudgeon that hates anything. Uh, but he's the music snob of the crew. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. <laughs> no, but I totally was into it from, uh, from the get-go. I just thought the idea of having someone who can break you out of your, uh, you know, your old patterns or your comfort zone and make you yeah, just make you grow as a performer is great because I know when I'm on stage sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm rocking out, you know, and I'm I'm moving my guitar in reality, you know, three inches. But I, to me, it feels like I'm swinging it up and down. Right. Just the difference between your perception and reality is pretty big sometimes. So Definitely. And, well, and I think he's added some new vocabulary to, to our discussions. It's, I mean, the way he talks about um, making moments on stage and creating those moments between the audience and um, and the performer, and then using those moments to actually get people to the merch table is really interesting, and it's a neat way of looking at it, and I think that he's given us a vocabulary and sort of an understanding of that that will sort of run through future episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I don't know if it's just Portland or if it's just a general or a general trend in music, but I've just noticed that uh, so many shows I've been to, and a lot of them have been like signed indie acts that, you know, they're not known they're not household names but you know they're on a label and they're they're touring professionally and that I've seen their their shows it's just like they just show up they play down the album they don't even talk to the audience they don't even look at the audience I I went to one where it's like I'm standing there you want to wave hello (laughs) are you even gonna look at us (laughs) or there was one band uh, the the band I referenced in the interview was Interpol where their show they came out and it was like watching a rehearsal. It was like they did not want to be there. Bored stiff. They looking. they were just like in between songs. It was just like they were just goofing off and messing with their gear. And it was just it was just bizarre. They never said anything to the audience. And uh, I I only paid. It was like the local radio station did this deal where it's like nine dollars to go to this show. And there's like come see them before they're enormous, you know. And uh, they came back through town and my friend had a ticket and he's like, you want to go? And I'm like. Dude, you'd have to pay me to go to that show. I don't want to go sit through that again. That was torture. I mean, they call musicians performers for a reason. You're supposed to perform and put on a show. And, you know, the just getting up there and playing your music isn't good enough. I know when I saw the Pixies reunion tour, it was great to hear all these songs played live and, and perfectly. But 
you know, they just kind of stood up there and did their thing and looked kind of like I couldn't even tell if they were enjoying themselves, really. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the biggest points I think Tom made that just because you write good songs doesn't mean you know anything about performing. And that's where I was kind of curious if it's just a general trend that now that we spend so much more time like writing music at home and recording uh, and probably less time thinking about the live aspect, that if that's kind of this trend of people just getting worse at that craft. Because I know like when I started out, the only thing you could do really is if you wanted to record an album, you had to have a record deal or at least a lot of money to drop on a studio. And so what you focused on was your live performance, getting out and, and building a, a live audience. And cause that was Well, I think, yeah, now that everyone can make albums, they everyone thinks they should go out and play shows. And there's this sort of trend of earnestness where everyone wants to, you know, be very uh, hard on sleeve and not s- having anything smack of uh, showmanship almost like that. That's passe. To, right. to be putting something on like that. so well, and That's why I was wondering if it was just Portland, because Portland seems to have more of that, that vibe where it's like they want to be authentic. And- well, there was the grunge revolution. I mean, after grunge, like you just put on jeans and do your thing on stage and, you know, like you're not going to wear any sparkles. You're not going to do any high kicks, you know, like you're just going to be yourself. But that being said, Kurt Cobain was still jumping off of speaker cabinets and into the crowd and putting on a show. Right, right. But I think some people got kind of confused by that aesthetic is Mm -hmm. that, you know, like you just be yourself on stage and you just perform the songs. And most people would probably be shocked to find out that a lot of what Kurt Cobain was doing was planned. Yeah, totally. And it wasn't like he was just in the moment doing that stuff. I mean, I think that's one of the things I noticed last year. I went through like this live music thing where every any live album I could get my hands on, I was checking it out just to see what was going on. And I'm a fan of U2, and so I got a whole bunch of various shows of theirs, both on video and, uh, you know, off the Internet. And it was amazing how much of these certain elements that you thought were so moving were there for, for years. You know, they'd been doing them. And it was things that, you know, they planned out, it worked, and so they kept it in the show. And obviously it's not exactly the same every time, and that's where I think the spontaneity aspect comes in. One thing that that just reminded me of uh, when I was listening to the interview, I was curious about how you tailor the, if you're more of like a local band and you happen to be playing in the same region pretty frequently, how do you do these things every show or, you know, frequently enough where your audience that's coming to see you a lot doesn't get sick of them and say, oh... They're just running through the script. It's okay if you're you too, because yeah. you're only going to come through town every three years. But I had a friend when I was in college who was in this great sort of arty hardcore band, and he was just this amazing performer. He had all these crazy moves that looked so weird and different that you were just riveted to him every time this band performed. And I learned later, just to my amazement, that he was stealing all his moves from performers. He'd be like, he would, he would actually, at one point, ran through some of the moves that he'd do on stage and be like, I got this one from Prince. I got this one from David Bowie. I got this one from Michael Jackson. Like, he would watch videos and watch people do their moves and then incorporate them. But because the context was so different, no one would have ever guessed that this guy screaming into a microphone in front of a hardcore band was borrowing moves from Prince. Uh-huh. You know? Right, right. <laughs> but it never wore off on you. You liked it every time. I liked it every time. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's one thing I learned as well is that um, when we were touring, we had this uh, medley of songs from the '70s. We did. It was this really cool collection of songs we had. Captain spent, and Tennille. Oh, yeah, yeah, Captain and Tennille. <laughs> but uh, it was this really cool collection of songs, and we spent a lot of time working up this medley because all of us were born in the '70s, and and. Uh, So it was kind of like a tribute to that era of, you know, where we came from. And it was this really fun moment in the show. And we'd been doing it for like a year. And I figured, you know, people were probably tired of it. And we stopped doing it. And it was like so many people were like, man, I wish you would do that. And it was just like, Mm. I think part of, you know, if you're doing something that works with the crowd, a lot of the reason why they want to come back and see you again is because they liked that moment and they want to see it again. So, I mean, you kind of have to look at it that way for as a performer, you tend to get bored of what you're doing. Because, you know, you're doing it every time, but it's not necessarily the same people out there. And it's also part of the reason they're coming back to see you. I think you could, if you're a local band, you could find, 
several things that work really well and then kind of rotate them in and out. One interesting mm-hmm. one interesting way to observe and I think observing, you know, performers is is one of the best ways to 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 learn, but if you go to a karaoke night at a local bar and you watch the performers, the seasoned karaoke people, they've got a whole bag full of moves, uh-huh. <laughs> you know. Totally, yeah. They they know all the moves and they've borrowed those moves from different performers and they work. You know, like when they hit that note and they lean over the table and whisper in your ear or whatever it is, you know, like you're just like, yes. And the other thing that reminds me of is th- those people that are the seasoned karaoke folks know all the words. They never look at the screen, Yeah. which reminds me of Tom's thing about if you have to think on stage, you're yeah. going to get your lost. Whereas if you, everything's second nature, you're gonna, really going to be able to sell it. Yeah. Some of the things that he mentioned that I wrote down, one, playing songs live and playing songs on recording are two completely different things. And I think that's one of the, when we worked with him, that's one of the big things that he helped us see differently. And, and I mentioned that one particular song where it was kind of this intimate moment on the album where the drums just playing a kick like four on the floor and there's like this little hi-hat pattern and there's just kind of open guitar sound and keyboards. But live, that same drum pattern was just like destroying the moment because that kick, you know, on a sound system, it, the kick drum is just monstrous. And so we kind of totally stripped that down to where it just ended up being just the guitar and like a light ride cymbal starting it out and no keyboards and no nothing else. And then we kind of built it from there and... It actually, to the listener out in the audience, probably perceived it the same as the album, but with the way we played it was totally different. If we played it like it was on the album, the perception would have been uh, totally different, more like in your face, more, you know, no there, it would have been just like more of a flat line uh, performance across, you know, all our songs, which I think is what I've noticed. I see bands that rock, you know, that are rock bands, and it's like, it's all extreme the whole time, or singer, songwriters, and acoustic guitar, and it's just mellow flat line and I think what a key thing that Tom talks about and it's a one of his videos just talks about this is building moments into your show and he has this whole graph that he mentioned and it kind of draws the audience through the performance and there's moments where it's you know very intimate and there's moments where it's fun and there's moments where you're just kind of like really into your instrument and it's kind of like it's all about you just like technical stuff you know and that doesn't mean you're doing solos up and down the neck. That just means it looks like you're really into playing mm-hmm. your instrument or what you're doing. And uh, I think that visually gives the audience a lot more to to go on from your show and take away from your show. Well, it's interesting to think that actual arrangements can be modified based on the, just the fact that you're playing live. In your case, the sound system, but, you know, that could also be, you know, like playing in a smaller room. What are the acoustics of that sort of room and what kind of songs are going to do better? Mm-hmm. And uh, or even the size of the crowd or the the kind of crowd that you're playing to um, could all factor into how you play your set. And, you know, Fugazi is a good example. They they have like a catalog of hundreds of songs, but that they know backwards and forwards and they play to their audience. They, you know, they mix their songs together. They play it faster one night than slower another night. They um, play medleys of their songs. They just know the material so well and they read a crowd so well that they're, I mean, in a way it's almost unplanned, even mm-hmm. though not to say that you should <laughs> necessarily go up there without a plan. They just know their, their stuff so well and they know their audience so well that they're able to sort of improvise. So it's kind of like what Tom said in that, you know, you need to create structure and then within that structure, improvise. Well, and I would as, I would almost bet that they've probably rehearsed a lot of those transitions and things and they know them. And then when they get up on stage, if they want to do it, they someone cues everybody, this is where we're going. This right. is the right moment. Let's right. do it. And everybody knows what they're doing. It's not just a free for all because totally. that never works. But if you ever do get a chance to see Fugazi live, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> do they still only charge $5? I, Wasn't that their thing? They were yeah, only charging they $5 only, to get I bet, I bet. I'm sure that's still the case. They're very hard-lined in their musical philosophy. <laughs> One of the other key points I thought that he said was that uh, people go to shows to see people. And that was one point where I thought pe- uh, people listening might go, what? They go to see music. Well, yes, but I think the reason they go to a show is 
go see that experience live, which involves that person being there. And sometimes it's just like, I think with the bigger the artist, sometimes it's just like, wow, I'm in the same room as this amazing band. You know, there they are right there playing. And I think that's a lot of the draw of going to a show. You know, people are going to see you as a person. They want to see your personality. They want to see, learn something more about you that they didn't already know. Um, Another thing that was a key point was that people are buying moments. And uh, I think that is something that is is definitely true where they experience something in a show and they want run back to the table because and buy a shirt or a CD because they want they in, really want to remember that moment and it's sometimes that they liked the band the music and but I think a lot of times it's that something struck them as something they wanted to remember ex- they enjoyed the experience and they go buy that album you, you know what that it reminds me of and this is sort of a strange analogy but you know how like when you go to you know um six flags or an amusement park and you ride the roller coaster and when you get off the roller coaster and you're still all excited and and you know like bubbling over because it was such a crazy stomach churning experience you look up and there's pictures of you on the roller coaster at the moment of your, you know, worst fear or most excitement with a funny look on your face. And people just, you know, they buy those photos because they want to take something with them. Even though they're never going to look at it. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's not, <laughs> it's not like I'm going to make it my Facebook page. <laughs> Reminded me one time I was back east visiting my family and we went with my uh, aunt and uncle to go see the, um, what are they called? The Australian Pink Floyd, the Australian Pink Floyd cover band. And it was a great show, amazing. And at the end, my aunt went back to buy a CD, and I was like, why are you buying this CD? It's basically everything that's on the wall and animals and you know Pink Floyd albums. Why wouldn't you just listen to that? And she said, well, this is the band that just moved me. I was like, all right, there you go. Yep. Well, one thing Tom mentioned is like if if you did this or tweaked this and it you sold five or ten more copies a night, would you do it? And Obviously, everyone would say yes, but it is an uncomfortable process at times. Mm -hmm. When we worked with Tom, he even worked with where we stood during certain songs, you know, visually what we should be doing. And those that was probably the hardest stuff to to sit there and do and work on because you just felt stupid. But at least he was doing it with all of you, though. Yeah, it wasn't like one person. And and for us, it was like, you know, there's certain songs where it needs to be like, you know, it's a, a rock song. It needs to look more like we're rocking out and. And certain things where there just had to be movement on stage. And I think sometimes the guitar player will be standing here, the lead singer will be standing here, the, you know, bass player over there. And everyone is kind of doing their own thing, but they never move out of that little, you know, three foot radius. Mm -hmm. And after a while, that looks the same no matter what you're doing. And I think even seeing the stage as a whole and moving around across the stage because the audience, if you're going back and forth, they don't, you know, like towards the back of the stage and the front of the stage, that doesn't perceive any sort of real movement. Right. And and making connections with the other band members is always great to see yeah. on stage. You know, I mean, the classic, like, during an exciting part, during a song, sharing a mic with somebody is... it. It gets me every time. <laughs> and, and those are the things that you feel silly practicing. Or I never pass up an opportunity to plug my favorite movie of all time, but if anyone wants to see the best concert ever as far as stage movements and lighting and just keeping things changing, get Stop Making Sense by the Talking Heads. Totally scripted out, but it looks so fun. Amazing. I'll have to check that out. Um, before we move into the other section i did want to mention that uh, this this stuff that tom talks about applies to anybody i mean it's not just rock bands where i think people visualize how a rock band might pull it off uh you know right if you're playing cello you can't run across the stage and back (laughs) yeah exactly but i think i think one thing that like the singer take the singer songwriter uh sometimes they'll just sit themselves down on a stool and they'll just play their songs. And I think that's what he referenced in the interview. Like, if you stood up for this song and sold five more albums a night, would you do it? And I think it can be little things that you do, depending on, you know, your style of music, that, you know, if it's a singer-songwriter and you've been sitting there just singing all night, but then there's this real intense moment and you just stand up and are, like, totally into it, that has a very powerful 
presence on stage as well. And it's just something simple and it's not. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, just approaching your instrument with like passion itself is interesting to watch. Yeah. But there's so many different degrees of passion, so much, you know, so much to work with. Um, you know, I mean, I remember this great bass player who had all this energy. One of the most fascinating things about him was he chewed gum on stage. But he just had this swarthy way of chewing gum and it was magnetizing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on. We had lots of great feedback about our discussion on Twitter. And a couple artists called in with some pointers. So we're going to get to that right now. CD Baby, CD Baby Podcast. Message line. 206-426-5683. The number you have dialed. 206-426-5683. Hey there, this is Matthew Ebel from MatthewEbel.com. I just caught the DIY podcast episode number 42 where you were talking about Twitter, and I had a couple of comments about that. Uh, you had mentioned that Twitter is sort of like your Facebook status. Well, it actually can be your Facebook status. There's a Twitter app on Facebook that lets you sync the two together, so anytime you update Twitter, you're updating your Facebook status as well. I've actually started quite a few conversations with some of my friends and fans uh, by updating my Twitter, and then they go in on Facebook and see what I just said. Not only is Twitter searchable, by the way, Google actually goes out and indexes Twitter on a daily basis. So do yourself a favor, set up a Google alert or two or 12 that specifically looks for people on Twitter talking about your name or your band name or anything else you're interested in. So Google will feed you a digest at the end of the day of all the people who are talking about all those things, even if you missed that tweet during the day, and then you can act accordingly. Also, do you have a mailing list? Have you checked to see how many of those people on your mailing list are already on Twitter? If you haven't, why not? It's easy. Just export your mailing list as a CSV file, a comma-separated variable file, and uh, upload it to Twitter directly. Then you can just follow everyone who's already subscribed to your email list anyway. At the very least, they'll know that you care about what they have to say, and at best, you might turn a casual subscriber into a hardcore fan. Also, you mentioned shameless promotion on Twitter. Well, there's a way to do that, too, and do it properly. Twitter right now is free, so you can just set up another account and set it up like a feed, just like you would with RSS. The Twitter Tools plugin for WordPress will actually automatically update your Twitter feed anytime you post to your blog. Most of the comments on my blog come from people who caught the tweet about a blog post. So it's, it's another way to do things automatically. So there's just a few tips and comments about Twitter. If you have any questions or don't know how to do all the stuff I just mentioned, feel, feel free to email me with comments or questions over at matthewebel.com slash contact, and I'll be happy to help you out. Hi, CD Baby. This is uh, Levi Spites in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm with the band The Dundies, and I'm calling um, about your recent uh, thing you guys were talking about about Twitter. And uh, my band and I, we've been on Twitter for a little over probably a month and a half now. And the way we do it is um, all three of us in the band um, use the same Twitter account. And uh, it's called uh, twitter.com slash the Dundies. And uh, what we do is we put our name and then a dash and then our Twitter update. And we also have a widget on our MySpace page so that people can keep track of what we're doing throughout the day. And uh, I think it really helps out with the uh, fan interaction. And it helps, you know, people who are interested in our music and in our lives uh, keep touch with us and know what we're doing and where we're at and where we're, uh, stuff that's happening. Um, also, then when we're recording, we're working on new music. We're talking about it on Twitter, and uh, we get a lot of input from uh, people about that kind of stuff. And it's really helped, I think, um, allowed us to have a much better connection with our uh, fan base. Anyways, love your show. And uh, like I said, you can check us out at, or you can follow us at twitter.com slash the Dundies. All right. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Bye. And thanks to Matthew Ebel and the Dundies for those comments. I have to say that uh, I follow both of them on Twitter and they are both doing Twitter very well. So definitely worth checking out. And uh, they both do it differently, which I think is interesting. The Dundies, it seems like they use it mainly to power what's on their MySpace page and uh, Matthew Ebel has a whole slew of followers and rabid fans, apparently. So. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that you could uh, you set it up so that your your Twitter is posting directly into your Facebook status. 
Yeah, you can. And there's some other tricks like that you can do. And like he mentioned, uh, whenever you post to a blog, it can send a, a Twitter post. And so if you're if you're an artist that's just new on Twitter and want to see what some other uh, bands and artists are doing that uh, seem to be using Twitter the right way, you, I would definitely check out both of those, Matthew Ebel and the Dundies. And um, they're fans of the show. So, And I, I have an email here from Ann Roos. She was an uh, interview for our show. She had the book called Musician's Guide to Brides. Um, but she had uh, sort of a different take on, on Twitter and social networking. I'll just read a little bit of her email here. She says, I listened to episode 42 with a lot of interest. Here are my thoughts. When I was a radio announcer a few years ago, there was a listener who called to say, you're from Tahoe, correct? And I answered yes. Then you said something like, I know who you are and I know exactly where you live. This totally creeped me out. I use Twitter, MySpace, and other social network platforms for only for business. That's it. But there's a way to do this that does not smell of shameless self-promotion. Privacy matters on networking sites is like the big elephant in the room. It's there, and no one really wants to admit what can happen to information that is given away too publicly. So Anne just wanted us to mention that there are some dangers or, or things to be careful of as far as publicly announcing things about yourself and your life and where you are at every moment during the day. I, I suppose we're all a little bit, you know, the social networking is a little bit new and, uh, you know, do be careful about the sort of information you're giving out to the to the world. Yeah, they are public platforms. And and I think in the email, Anne brought up the idea of she's leaving gigs. She just plays a solo harp thing. And, you know, it's just her sometimes going out to her car or whatever. And there's kind of a fine line between, you know, letting people know what you're doing and, and getting stalkers, especially from the perspective of a woman, I would say, is different than sometimes what us guys think about. So <laughs> so that was good advice that uh, she had, a uh, different perspective and worth mentioning. Well, now we have some... Uh, we have some calls that were just uh, some general feedback calls I want to get to, and uh, here we go. Hi, guys. Rich Palmer, richpalmer.com. And I was listening to your episode, the roundtable episode, where we were talking about uh, telling your story and heard some of the comments called in. Even my buddy Matthew Evil called in. Good to hear. But the comment on the artist who got the mall or the, uh, uh, the Christmas CD to be given away, fantastic idea i had something very similar i do a, a children i have a children's album uh, called sing a song for safety and it's all about safety songs uh, safety tips skills that parents can use with their kids through music and uh, what i did was approached one of the local burn foundations who uh, is sponsored by police departments fire departments around the montgomery county ohio area and told them that i was producing this cd and what the content and topics were on the CD. They purchased uh, over 300 and uh, I believe 350 of these CDs to be given to local fire departments and preschools and daycare centers so that they could share the messages that were on the songs with those areas as well. So all things considered, that initial purchase was enough to give me uh, enough funds to finish my master and my production. So one way to help me get my foot, you know, running, <laughs> my feet on the ground running and get that CD produced and out there in the marketplace. So uh, basically everything was uh, profit to me on any sales after that point. So I thought that was a great example with the Christmas CD. There are different ways that many artists can use to, uh, to reach out in non-traditional methods. Uh, iTunes may not be your best source, you know, a CD on a shelf is not always your best source because you have to wait for people to discover that. But if you can reach out into areas that may benefit, you provide them a win-win. It's a great idea. Thanks for the show, guys. I appreciate it. Always great topics on there. Rich Palmer over at richpalmer.com. This is Jennings calling to tell you that everything I've learned about the music industry, I've learned from CD Baby. Check out my new album, Fantastic, right here at cdbaby.com. Hey guys, this is Scott Andrew. I'm a singer-songwriter in Seattle, and I have a comment regarding episode 42 and the woman who ended up damaging her relationship with the local radio station because they wouldn't return her CD. Uh, burning bridges sucks. But I just wanted to say that uh, don't forget that relationships can be mended if both parties are willing to talk to each other. I have an example uh, from my own experience. A few years ago, I booked a show 
uh, a few days prior, I checked the venue's website and saw that they had the wrong date for the show. And I got really, really upset. I called the venue and ended up talking to the new manager. I could tell by listening to the phone that he was busy serving customers, but I kind of just grouched and spat out a demand that the website be changed as soon as possible. And he kind of grouched back at me and we ended up hanging up on each other. So on my way to the venue, I realized that if I were in the manager's position, I would never book someone like me ever again, especially after the phone conversation like the one we had. Um, So when I got to the venue, I calmed down and I made a point of meeting the manager and I said, look, I'm sorry I freaked out. I know you were busy. I didn't handle that well at all. And the manager shook my hand and said, apology accepted. No apology necessary. And we talked and I went on to have a really great relationship with that venue. And uh, I just wanted to say that it always seems like it's the petty, tiny things like unreturned CDs or a misspelled name or out-of-date website that blow up into these huge issues. But it's pretty easy to repair relationships if you reach out and you're just honest about it. And if the other party isn't ready to bury the hatchet, well, at least you try. Uh, That's it. My name's Scott Andrew, and you can find me on the web at scottandrew.com. Thanks, guys. That was great advice. Yeah, Yeah, totally. Thanks for all that feedback. Yeah, I I think it's funny. Artists, we always tend to think that every little detail is this enormous problem. You misspelled my website. My name spelled wrong. And uh, yeah, you definitely got to remember, especially if you're playing in that community over and over again, that, you know, it's not that big of a deal. That re- long-term relationship with that club booker or manager or whatever, uh, publicity person, newspaper person, is far more important than, you know, a misspelling and on a website for a few days. Yeah. So. Musicians tend to be, well, I think most artists are a, a passive-aggressive bunch, so when you have those little stumbling points you, it's really tough to mend for most people but that direct approach of just being like hey man i was totally out of line yeah, yeah. It's, it seems such a revolutionary idea yeah. and, <laughs> and also not only did did that mend the relationship but in the future if you do happen to blow up at something the manager knows oh you know he he does that or the the club booker <laughs> <laughs> knows he, he doesn't mean any harm he's sorry <laughs> 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 but also the feedback about uh the, the artist who wrote songs about uh, safety for kids went to the burn center and, and they ended up buying 350 copies of his album to give out i think that's definitely good advice about thinking out of the box of who might be interested in your music um i know derek used to always tell this story about uh this girl that was a top seller at CD Baby for a while who wrote songs about sailing. Oh, yeah. And so she would go to all the sailing magazines, you know, not typically writing song, uh, writing articles about music, and she'd get covered in all these magazines because it's like, oh, the perfect music for our clientele, you know? Yeah. And she'd sell a lot of albums to people who like to sail. So your your target audience may not be the music store or, you know, traditional music outlets. So that was good advice. So if you're interested in joining in on the conversation, we'd love to hear from you. The listener line is 206-426-5683, or uh, you can send us an email, or you can leave a comment on the podcast website, which is cdbabypodcast.com, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. There's been some good comments. Someone left a comment about uh, referring to Tom Jackson, that they video every show, and that's one way they help improve their performances, and... I know I heard back from Matthew Ebel, who left the phone message, how he doesn't know how to negotiate the, the performance issue when you're playing at a bar and nobody cares. And So if you have some comments or feedback about the show, we'd love to get it. And uh, if you specifically have something that seems to be working at your show that uh, you think would be valuable for everyone else to hear, we definitely would like to get that on the show and share with everyone else. So feel free to call in interact and whatever (laughs) (laughs) time for some more coffee my brain is not working yet this morning it's nine in the morning so yeah call in we'd love to interact with you and hear what you have to say that's gonna do it for this edition of the podcast unless you guys have anything else to tell you about my dream last night oh I'd love to hear You've been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 